Hello, today's notes are going to be cellular respiration breakdown. This is a more advanced understanding of cellular respiration. And I have another video that does a more generalized overview and would work really well as an intro before doing this one, because this video is going to be a lot more detail of the actual process itself. For today's notes in our outline here, I'm gonna do a brief introduction and overview of the process of cellular respiration with a focus on two substances that we see in cellular respiration. Then I'm gonna go through the three stages, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. At the end, I will have a full diagram to review all of those stages at the same time. With each slide, you can pause and fill out the guided notes found in the description below, or you can watch the video straight through. Now, before we get started with the process of cellular respiration, it's really important that we talk about energy. All living organisms need energy. And because energy cannot be created nor destroyed, it is constantly changing form. We as living organisms need energy to be in a chemical form. The chemical we use is called ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, which is shown in the image here. There are three phosphate groups, those yellow circles, attached to a sugar and an adenine. Like I said, this is a chemical. Chemical energy is stored in the bonds between the atoms of a molecule. The energy that our bodies are using to do work from ATP is found in the bond between the second and last phosphate group, seen here. That single bond is going to be the amount of energy we consume with one ATP. Therefore, the body requires millions of ATP in a single day to function because this is a small burst of energy. Therefore, we need a constant production of ATP in order to survive, since this molecule is our energy source for all functions. The other molecule for energy that I want to talk about is glucose. This is a six carbon sugar, which is why it has this hexagon shape. This is the sugar that is produced by photosynthesis, and this is another form of chemical energy. Again, chemical energy is in the bonds between the different atoms of a molecule. So in glucose, all these lines you see on screen are going to represent stored energy. It is important to note that when we teach cellular respiration, especially in high school, we focus on the carbons through the whole process for simplicity. But there are other bonds with oxygens and hydrogens in glucose that are also going to be altered and broken down throughout the process. So from one single glucose, we're going to produce around 38 ATP molecules. So all of the energy in the bonds of one glucose is equivalent to all of the energy in 38 ATP molecules. So that brings us to the definition of cellular respiration which is basically how we get from one glucose to 38 ATPs. And it needs to go through three stages to make our final product. So we're gonna go through each of these stages listed here and discuss how the energy is flowing through this process. So we will start with stage one, glycolysis. So cellular respiration is known to take place in an organelle called the mitochondria. However, this first step takes place outside of the mitochondria before we can get started. So it takes place in the cytoplasm, in the cell goo environment outside of the mitochondria. So glycolysis is the splitting of that six carbon glucose into two three carbon pyruvates. So those two structures you see on screen um, at the end of the reaction, those are pyruvates. So we're splitting it in half. 
So the process of glycolysis both requires and releases energy. Like you'd say, it takes money to make money, it takes energy to produce energy. So the amount of energy it needs to do this process is two ATPs. However, at the end of glycolysis, four ATPs are produced. So we say this is a net production of two ATP. Now, as we are breaking down bonds and we talk about some energy being released, a lot of that's going to be in the form of electrons. These electrons are in an energized or excited state. So as we're breaking things down, some of these electrons are going to be picked up by electron carriers. And their name is exactly their job. They are in charge of carrying and transporting these electrons. So in glycolysis, we're going to have the electron carrier NAD+. And it is going to pick up two electrons and become NADH. And this happens twice, so we have two NADHs as a result of glycolysis. These NADHs are going to then be used to take the electrons to our third stage, the electron transport chain. So that is the stage of glycolysis. So we go from glucose to two pyruvates. We have two NADHs and two ATPs. So the number two is very important in glycolysis. Now let's go into the second stage. We're gonna talk about the Krebs cycle. This is probably the most complicated part when you have to study cellular respiration. We're gonna simplify it by focusing on the carbons and the main energy products that we're looking for. So as we enter the Krebs cycle, we have two pyruvates. So each pyruvate needs to go through the cycle one time. So you're gonna have the cycle go twice, one for one pyruvate, one for the next one. Now we are inside the mitochondria. This stage will take place in the mitochondrial matrix, the liquid environment inside of the mitochondria. As we are getting started in the Krebs cycle, the pyruvate has to go through sort of this processing step. It's gonna be broken down and modified into a two carbon molecule that is connected to a coenzyme. So at the end, we have what's called acetyl-CoA. So you can see here, at the beginning, we have our three carbon pyruvate. We're then going to go through a process with enzymes and we're going to break off a carbon. So now we have two and we have acetyl-CoA. So this intro step results in one carbon dioxide being released per pyruvate and one NADH. So that means that we lost another two electrons. Since we did this with two pyruvates, you will ultimately have two carbon dioxides and two NADHs as a result of this step. Now, to enter the Krebs cycle, this two carbon acetyl-CoA is going to combine to a four carbon molecule. So we're gonna lose that coenzyme and now we have our six carbon structure that's gonna go through the cycle. Now, like I said, there are the hydrogens and oxygens that are going to be a part of glucose, the original glucose playing roles, but for simplicity's sake, we're gonna focus on these carbons. So as this six carbon structure goes through the cycle, we're going to be breaking and rearranging bonds. At the end of the cycle, we're gonna have three NADHs. So we had three NAD pluses, pick up two electrons each, resulting in three NADHs. There's another electron carrier called FAD, and this one is going to um, pick up two electrons and become FADH2. So with our electron carriers, we're going to have three NADHs and one FADH2 produced as a result of the Krebs cycle. 
Then we're gonna have two carbon dioxides that are released because we started with that two carbon molecule that entered and those are both gonna be broken off and released as carbon dioxides. The four carbon molecule that we started with will be recycled and go pick up the next acetyl-CoA. Once again, it's important to remember that this process happens twice. So all of this relates to a single pyruvate, but for one glucose, you're gonna do pyruvate twice. So here I have sort of a simplified diagram of the Krebs cycle. So here we've started where pyru one pyruvate has come in and it's attached to this coenzyme. So we start with our acetyl-CoA. As we go into the cycle, the two carbons will attach to our four carbon molecule. As we go through, you'll see we lose one carbon as carbon dioxide. We also have some of those energized electrons picked up and we have NADH. We then repeat this process one more time. We lose the second carbon as carbon dioxide and again form another NADH. At this point, as far as carbons go, we're just down to the four carbon molecule that we started with. But there's going to be a lot of different elements attached to it and structures of bonds that need to be reconfigured to get us back to this. So as it rearranges its bonds and breaks down things further, it's actually gonna form a molecule called GTP, which is pretty much equivalent to ATP because it goes through one modification. So we actually count this as part of the total of ATP that would be made. It's then gonna produce one FADH2, another electron carrier, and then that last NADH. At the end of these steps, it's going to go back to its original structure to pick up another acetyl-CoA. Once again, all of the numbers you see, you would multiply by two to get the total result. So at the end of this cycle, you have actually produced six NADHs, two FADH2s, and two GTPs. Now for the final stage and the big production stage of cellular respiration, the electron transport chain. So we've been picking up all of these excited or energized electrons with the electron carriers. So this is where they're carrying them to. They're going to go and deliver these electrons to the intermembrane of the mitochondria. So you can see down here, this is our membrane, this bilayer with the blue heads and tails. So we're gonna go to the intermembrane of the mitochondria with NADH and FADH2. So as they deliver and release the electrons, the electrons are gonna pass through a series of proteins. So these blobs here are going to be the proteins found inside of the intermembrane. As the electrons move through, they're actually gonna be releasing their energy to the protein, giving the proteins the energy they need to push hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space up here. So you can see here that we're pushing hydrogens and creating a high concentration of hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space. This is important because in cells, we wanna move down what we call a concentration gradient, where we have a higher concentration on one side compared to the concentration on the other. So we're using this energy and pushing all of these hydrogens through, and now we've created this concentration gradient with a high concentration of hydrogens that are gonna go through a very important protein called ATP synthase. ATP synthase uses hydrogen ions like a car uses gasoline. This is what it runs on. So all the energy we've been talking about has been transforming between different forms. So the electrons have now released their energy and it's used towards movement and work energy to push these through. And as we have the concentration gradient building up, these hydrogens will now go through and they will power this ATP synthase. 
the ATP synthase, since it is now turned on, is going to produce the ATP molecules that we need. And it produces about 34 ATP molecules. Depends on your textbook, your teacher, it might be 34 or it might be around that number. So it's around 34 ATP produced from a single glucose when these electrons make it to the electron transport chain. Now, once the electrons have gone through these proteins, they don't just get abandoned or forgotten about, they need to be picked up. So they have given their energy, but they're still electrons. So they're gonna be taken in by oxygen, which is called the final electron acceptor. So oxygen, which we breathe in and take in for cellular respiration, is really important at the end here by accepting that electron and then some hydrogen ions that might not make it here are going to come in and we're going to form water. So this is where our product of water comes from as oxygen is there to capture that electron after it's released its energy to all these proteins and goes with hydrogen and we have water as that product. You can also see down here NAD plus and FAD no longer have their hydrogens. So they're going to go back to the beginning of the cycle or to the Krebs cycle and they're going to pick up more of those electrons because we need to be producing ATP continuously. We need to keep pushing those hydrogens out to then turn on the ATP synthase. So here we have a pretty simplified diagram showing the entire process. So we start with glycolysis, where glucose is split into two pyruvates. This results in a total of two ATP being produced and two NADHs being formed. Once these pyruvates enter into the mitochondria, they're going to lose that third carbon becoming a two carbon compound with a coenzyme that we call acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA will then go through the Krebs cycle as it is broken down and rearranged, resulting in a total of eight NADHs. This is including the NADH from the acetyl-CoA formation and from the cycle. We will also have two FADH2s produced as a result of the cycle. Two ATPs are formed. That's because of that GTP that was formed can be modified and becomes ATP. Also, the carbons as they're broken down are released as carbon dioxide. Then all of our electron carriers will bring these electrons to the electron transport chain that'll give energy to the uh, transport proteins in the membrane to push hydrogen ions through so that we can fuel up our ATP synthase and crank out about 34 ATP. Once the electrons have done their job, they will be accepted by oxygen, which will bind with some hydrogens, making water. So I hope that this gives you a better understanding of the process of cellular respiration. If you have any questions or would like me to clarify something further, please let me know in the comments, and I hope that you have a great day.